Larry in Santa Monica, California. Hey, Larry, what's up? Hey, Tom, how are you? Good. Great. You? Yeah, I just thought I wanted to bring a little balance to the conversation that we're having about race. Um, I think that we need to make sure that we, we differentiate between someone who's a racist, someone who is uh, racially bigoted, and someone who is racially insensitive. And I think oftentimes when there is some a racial conflict in the country uh, that we automatically rush um, to call the white person who is the offender uh, racist. And that just may not always be the case. Um, I grew up in a multiracial family. <clears throat> I grew up in a white community that was about 98% white. And uh, I have biracial nephews, cousins, you name it. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, there's still, even though we have blood relations, there are some racial insensitive things that are said. Sure. That's happened all my life. And I think, that it's not, I think that it's more of a cultural conflict in many instances. Not all. Certainly there's racists out there. Certainly there's racial bigots out there. But I think in, 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 in many instances, it's a cultural conflict which white people are racially insensitive sometimes and, most, and many times unconsciously. Right. Growing up as a black kid in an all-white school, my culture growing up was white, period. Mm. Yeah. And that's the culture that I was comfortable with. My father grew up in South Central Los Angeles in the 40s and the 50s. And he was the only one of his brothers that pulled himself out of poverty and made it out. But we used to go back to L.A. in the summers, you know, mm -hmm. to visit my grandmother and my uncles and all of the family on his side. Right. And I would be terrified, terrified. I would literally cry when it came time for us to take that hour drive from the city that I lived in to South Central Los Angeles the culture was completely different. My cousins on that side, everything was different. Mm -hmm. And I did not like it. I was extremely uncomfortable. I didn't know why I was a kid. But it was culture. It was right. culture. Things that my cousins did. Things that, that my father's family said. Ways, actions, norms, habits were completely different from what I was accustomed to. And so I think that white people, when they're called racist, they get a sense I'm not a racist and they push back, and sometimes they'll shut down, and maybe they're not racist. Maybe they're racially insensitive, but we need to make sure that we're using right language so that we don't turn off people that really have goodwill. That's a great lesson, Larry, and an excellent point. Um, in, in that context, in the context of what you're talking about, do you think it would be reasonable to suggest that, on the one hand, uh, Officer Slam, uh, I think his name is Fields, actually, but everybody's calling him Officer Slam. Um, probably did what he did, not because this girl was black, but because she was being, uh, she was challenging his authority in his mind, and he is, uh, you know, a frightened little man sort of thing. You know, I mean, people who who use excessive force typically are, you know, have some sort of psychological problem. Um, in other words, he was violent, not racist. Number one, that's on the one hand. But on the other hand. Do you think that he would have done this if this had been, uh, you know, as a caller called in yesterday and said, if 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 if, she, uh, if it was a white girl named Becky? Right. Well, and here's the thing: it may be a combination of the two. He may be violent, and he may be. Uh, I heard the officer say that he had a black girlfriend, and yeah. so he may be violent. He may be racist. I don't know, to be honest, in his particular case. But uh, but I'm what I'm saying is, can't I those two things coexist? Possible. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, what I was saying is, can't those two things coexist? That that he was racially he racially insensitive and he was violent. I think that they can coexist. And here's and here's an example. I come not, my family is uh, I come from a law enforcement family. My father's a retired police officer. I have an uncle who's a retired FBI agent. Other uncles that are retired from military police and from uh, Los Angeles Police Department. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up in that kind of environment. And I, I listened to them when they would come home and tell their war stories and the things that they would do. And now these are black police officers, black law enforcement officers. And I heard one of your callers yesterday talk a little bit about this. 
But certainly, black law enforcement officers uh, are also, I think, show, and I'm I'm just, you know, just put it out there. I think that in in many instances, in in my uh, experience with black police officers as well, they tend to go overboard and they tend to be very harsh with black people. I would listen to the way my father talked about blacks, my uncles. It's almost a compensation. it 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 was a class issue. It was a class issue at that point. So, I, and so yes, they were being racially insensitive, even though they were black, but they were doing it for class reasons. Right. And, and, they were being, and they were being Biden as well. I think the same thing can happen with white police officers. I think that a white police officer can, can genuinely be not a racist. I think that he can genuinely be not racially bigoted. Right. In the case of this officer, maybe he does have a black girlfriend, but because he has these unconscious racial biases, and right. you combine that with violence. So if we know, take if we take uh, those three categories, the, the unconscious racial bias is something that probably all of us have. The yeah, the absolutely, absolutely. The, on the other end, uh, racism. You know, being a racist. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if this is an official definition or not, but but I read it some years ago in in a book about race relations, and it really stuck in my head as as being meaningful. I don't. I you know, feel free to challenge me on this. But a genuine racist is a person who uses their belief in their race's superiority to inflict harm or damage on people of other races. In other words, they actually have the power in some way. It might just be a small, you know, power like yelling at somebody in a parking lot, but they, 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 they go, they, you, they, they behave in a way that, that is uh, destructive or harmful to another race um, intentionally. And then that, what was that middle category? What were you calling that? Racially bigoted. Racially bigoted. Um, I, I, it means to be intolerant. Yeah. I think I think that if you are, in order to be a racist, you, you use the example that someone uses uh, power e- even in a small way to you know yell at someone in the parking lot. I don't think right. that that applies. I think in order to be a racist, a white racist, you must be a part of the white power structure. Right. You know, people in the Appalachian Mountains, what poor whites, they're not a part of the white power structure. They're in the same condition as poor blacks are in any other parts of this country. Right. And so in order to be a racist, you need to be a part of the white racial power structure, A, and B, you need to flex that power and right. use it. So the yelling, so the yelling in the parking lot is the is the bigot, the 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 the, the banker who says no, we won't uh, give you a mortgage because that's racist. Because that's racist. Okay, got it. That's yeah. racist. I agree. Absolutely. And so and, and and so because of that, we we label so many whites, you know. And I think it's simply because we you know it's we just don't we we we're not specific with our language. Yeah. And 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 and, and it it upsets me. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm caught in the middle uh, uh, in, in my, you know, the life path that I have. Right. And, I, and I, I say, well, you know, all, all white people are not racist. Certainly, you know, my sister, to, to be personal, mm-hmm. married a white man. Right. Who, when, you know, like some, some families don't work out, theirs didn't. But what's the first thing that comes out of his mouth? The N-word. Yikes. You know, and, he has a bi- and he has a biracial son, my nephew. And the first, you know, you inward to my sister. Now, do I think that that guy was a racist? I don't think so. But I think that in his anger, uh, he allowed for his racial bigotry yeah. to well up. Well, and, you know and it's I mean? also, it, you know, in, in relationships gone south, people tend to try to hit below the belt. They just grab the most powerful oh, word they can come up with. And absolutely. instead of calling her the B word or the C word, which might happen in, in a couple of the same race, he called her a racially charged word, probably just because he was PO'd, not... Yeah, that, or he came from a very small, 100% white community that he never saw a black person until he saw my sister. I yeah. think that yeah. may have played a part in it, too. Yeah. But, you know. It's interesting stuff. I'm telling you, we have the smartest listeners on earth. Larry, thank you for, for sharing your story with us and for your perspective. I, I, it's brilliant analysis. Thank you very much. Very considerate of you. 